those of you listening to this tape will find it profitable also to carry out this lesson that will be given to the class here today. If you're in class now, take down these instructions that will be given in a moment and bring them back at your next meeting and follow them out just as you will hear the information given to others. All right, take your paper and pencil, write at the top of it one sentence, which is helpful information about self-obedience. Helpful information about self-obedience. Now that's all you have to write down, except the numbers from 1 to 10, which you will fill in between now and tomorrow, and bring it to class and you will be reading your helpful information about self-obedience aloud to the class. I won't give you examples because you'll be hearing a number of them in the fairly brief talk that I'll go into in a minute. So in your own words, think of your own helpful facts about self-obedience and bring them to class tomorrow and we'll read them aloud and discuss them a little bit. All right. And you can begin to make connections between what you're to write and what we're going to talk about today. Let's start with an illustration. Imagine a, a family, mother and father, and say three children out in a park or out in the woods somewhere having a relaxed weekend. And the parents tell the children to stay pretty close to camp, not wander off anywhere not get into trouble and not get hurt. But children being children forget what they were told and so one of them wanders off into a into a creek and gets soaked, falls into the creek and gets wet and starts to cry about it. Another child climbs a tree and gets stuck, starts to cry because he's afraid up there all alone. So all three of the children get in trouble simply because they disobeyed the wise instructions of their parents to stay near the camp. And I think you obviously see the connection between that and the theme of self-obedience. Self-obedience is very simply defined. It's simply obedience to our own right, rec rightly recovered nature to what we really are, obedience to the kingdom of heaven within. But we don't obey because we also have something else in us which we can call a number of things. We can call it self-will. We can call it stubbornness. We can call it wanting our own way. We can call it vanity, egotism. We can call it the illusion that we know better than anyone else. And you know, back to these children a minute, one of them will go out and get stuck in the tree and Papa will get him down and safe again and pretty soon his tears dry up. And you know what he does five minutes later? You know. He's off tripping over a rock and bruising his knee and crying again. Mama puts some salve on it and then he's off again doing something else that gets him into trouble. So we never learn from the experience. We, we never learn. We're so thick-headed that we never learn that what we call self-will, disobedience to our real nature, uh, that disobedience, we never learn that disobedience to our real nature is what gets us into trouble. And as long as we don't have the suspicion, the first hint, if you prefer to call it that, that we do have a real nature, as long as we don't see that, we will continue to stumble and get hurt and cry all the time, which is the story of the life of practically every human being. That's your story, isn't it? This is the way we've lived all the time, in bitterness and fear of everything. Now, thank you. Why 
why among other things yes that's fine fine thank you let's get our conditioning into this we were all brought into up into some kind of an organization or church or society in general that gives us a set of rules how to behave moral rules religious rules rules of etiquette uh, rules governing success and failure you have to be a success we so identify with these fixed rules so that they become a part of us that we actually feel guilty about disobeying them which we have to start doing if we're going to be obedient to one thing we have to start being disobedient the right disobedience to something else but that involves a sense of guilt over leaving the rules that were given to us you know about that it involves a sense of insecurity because if I leave everything that I've told that was right then I'm going to be wrong and I'm going to be a bad person I'm not going to be a respectable man or woman anymore who who is quote good Do you know how many few good people there are in this world, really good people? I think you could probably count them on one hand. They do exist, but I don't know where. But we have called it a goodness, and so we're stuck with it. And we never see, we never see the contradiction between the rule, I must be good, and the fact that we never are good. Good simply meaning living from our own nature so we're going to talk a little bit right out in, in the open in the whole class here about the idea of simply being obedient to the right thing which means a lot of hard work to see what the wrong thing is the wrong thing the a wrong obedience is the obedience to excitement we take excitement as being right when it's nothing but an excitement. Why does it make it right just because it's exciting? War is exciting to many people. Crime is exciting to many people, which doesn't make it right. So we have to come to a point of shock, of being in midair, that is, breaking away from now, picture a bridge in your mind. Maybe that will help. On one side of the bridge, on one bank, is this collection of foolish habits, of vanity, of wanting to be safe and secure by associating with people who think as I think, members of the same religious group or business club, business organization, or family. And I want to stay on this side of the bridge because that is way the side where I feel secure but I'm not secure I'm scared to death and scared of death by the way I'm terrified but I don't know what else to do if I'm fortunate enough I will get a glimpse of this bridge which takes me over on the other side but I don't know what's over there so I'm not going to go and find out it's too scary I'm going to stay right where I am I'm going to stay right where I am in my comfortable misery and be obedient to sickness. I'm going to be obedient to this sickness that has ruined me and punished me all my life. Can you think of anything more ridiculous? <clears throat> because we don't know any better. Not only that, not only that, but picture this bridge again. If I, if I get fed up, with my misery and my lying and my hypocrisy and I want to cross over to the other shore over there the minute I put my foot on the first step of that bridge it starts to shake both the bridge and my foot because the bridge the bridge though is safe perfectly safe I, I'm telling you right now that that bridge by which you cross over from this miserable land to the other one in which there is no misery the bridge itself is perfectly safe but you don't know that I don't know that until I do it 
and you can't have any guarantees about the safety of, of that bridge. I'm telling you that it is. But you have to take that first step and be real scared, shake, then take the next step. It's still as shaky, the second one. As a matter of fact, the farther you step across this bridge, the shakier it gets. It doesn't get more secure. The way out is to get more scared, not less scared. You're following this, aren't you? Aren't you? Mm-hmm. How many of you have seen, through self-study, how many of you have seen, for example, a hatred in you that so shocked you because you never knew it was in there? Huh? You're, some people are raising their hands, mm-hmm. and those of you listening to this tape should raise your hands too, because you have it in you. I know you have, and you know it have. How about suddenly seeing a bit of violence in yourself that you never knew existed because you never studied it yourself, never examined yourself. This is the shaking we're talking about. The farther you go on that bridge, the more you hang on to the side because you're scared you're going to be plunged down into the bottom. You won't be. I'm telling you, it's safe. But you have to do it. So that when you're in the middle of the bridge, you're so terrified you wish you will wish you had never started but thank god you did because if you hadn't started you're going to be right over there with all your lying friends just as you were a liar and still are by the way pretending that you're happy and it's only a pretense isn't it huh thank heaven that when you first sighted this bridge which is a miracle in itself and you put that first foot out, you didn't pull it back. But you, you stood there and shook and wanted to go back to your hypocritical friends and have them comfort you and tell you that this is the right place to be. Don't go back to liars. If you go back to liars, you have to go back to being a liar yourself. And now you have to suffer, don't you? Huh? Then the third step, it gets worse, I pay it. The, the farther you go, the worse it gets. But you know what is happening, don't you? You are doing something that is, I'm going to get as many synonyms as I can. You're doing, when you're out on that bridge, whether the first step or the third or the tenth, in order to get across, I will tell you something very happy and very encouraging. You are, for the first time in your life, doing something that is sane intelligent self-transforming happy yet yeah, you're getting happy when you're getting more miserable because you're destroying the source of your misery i can't think of any more synonyms maybe you can but any positive word would do to put it in another way which the new testament states you're coming to the end of yourself what you call yourself and when you get on the other shore a very peculiar state now exists which is the fact that you no longer exist but the fact that you no longer exist is no longer frightening I wonder whether you can see this or not it's it's impossible to explain to you as long as you want to exist as Tom Smith the nice man Mary Jones the wonderful woman as long as you have these ideas about yourself you're in misery you still want to exist in a false way you're being obedient to falseness that's what it amounts to on the other shore on the other side having gone over the scary bridge one timid step at a time you begin to see the falseness of wanting to be what you call a wonderful man or a wonderful woman so that all ideas about yourself disappear and the farther you go across the bridge the more they disappear that is ideas disappear thoughts disappear labels disappear and finally after this long and hard work and when you're on the other side you now listen to this you no longer have any problems whatever i said none no problems you have things to do but you have no problems because when you were on the other shore the fact that you wanted to be someone was the problem that you wanted to label yourself even labeling yourself as 
a sinner or as an evil person. That's just as much a label as calling yourself good. So when you no longer exist according to idea on the other side of the bridge, you're out of it. There's no more fear. There's fear only as long as you're trying to hang on to yourself and doing all these allied things such as wanting people to agree with you and going to parties and stuff where everyone compliments each other and destroys each other. Don't you know that phoniness with another person or with another group of people is destroying you? I want to see your hands. Do you know this or don't you? Yes. Don't you know that phoniness destroys? Then I will ask you, and ask you listening to this tape, why do you continue being a phony? And I'll tell you why briefly, then we'll discuss things. You continue being a phony because you don't know what else to do. That's what it amounts to. You don't know what else to do with yourself, with your life. The purpose and the value of this class, of this group, is to show you a totally new way to live as a human being in this world. Don't try to believe what I'm telling you. We're here to work together to experience it personally through hard, earnest work. And you, I will tell you that if you will do this, if you will leave that desolate shore and put that first foot out on the bridge and then the second, then the third, and start being obedient to who you really are instead of to all the nonsensical ideas you have about yourself, you will indeed prove for yourself something that very few human beings ever prove on this earth. They're not going to make it. Do you want to make it? Then you can do so. And you will find that you will indeed have a problem-free life. Because you no longer exist as a false human being who has created all the problems. This lady here has no problems except those she creates daily in her daily life. This man has no problems except those that he creates. And we create it through living on the mental level where all falseness is created. And we're learning in this group, and I hope you're learning in your group, those of you listening to the tape, learning to live above the mental level. And you learn to live it by putting the fourth foot out, and then the fifth foot, the sixth and seventh step, until you get over on the other side. But I must tell you, when you have taken that first step, the second or the tenth and you're terrified of where you are I'll tell you what I want you to do I want you to stay right there right in your terror don't try to escape it don't you know you can run into so many errors and I'll tell you what happens to many people uh, religious people for example who call themselves religious they might have even have taken that first step over the bridge and it gets so frightening that they immediately build an illusory opposite shore. Follow this and you'll see what I mean. You'll understand it. They take that first step of trying to get to the other side where they are no more in illusion. But it's so terrifying that they build an illusory other shore. And that can consist of a thousand things. The illusory other shore, the substitute other shore, is made up even of religious practices, of religious beliefs of talking about God and even teaching God to other people. This is still their trap. They've got a false other shore and you can tell it by the, the expression on their face, can't you? How they suddenly don't know what to say when you ask them a question. They don't know what to say because they don't know the answer themselves or they go into some foolish, foolish religious practice. There's a thousand and one escapes intended to make one think that he has arrived when he is only in a substitute shore. And there, it's very difficult to tell a person living in this that he's living in illusion. Because then he has to start all over again on the bridge and he's too scared. He really hasn't done a thing but deluded himself into thinking that he's over there when he's right back where he always was. He's simply given it a new label. He's living in a haunted house, which he calls a castle. 
in summary, then we'll discuss. And let's try to make our discussion revolve around the idea of being obedient to the right thing. That is, obedient to what I really am, to what this man really is, to what this lady really is, which is an unlabeled expression of truth living here on earth. If you can find another way to define that, go right ahead. A good, a right way to define it. Let's be obedient to our own real nature, which means I am no longer in conflict with myself and therefore not with you or with events out in that world, no matter what that event might be. I can be perfectly free living in a chaotic world, and this is what we're after. For example, you might in your comments now tell the rest of the group and those listening to the tape, tell them how we can begin to be more obedient to ourselves, to our real nature, instead of to this stupid, foolish imposter that's been living inside of us all these years, making us do stupid, dumb, painful things. How can we help ourselves be true to ourselves? By first seeing that we can't obey ourselves. That we can't obey ourselves? Right. Yeah, that's good. Go ahead, uh, give us a detail on that. We have to carry Christ in order to see that. For example, I might say, I'm, I see myself getting angry every day. So I want to say, I want to try to work and see if I, I have the possibility of not getting angry. Why do I get angry? And if I start seeing this, <coughs> it might take a long time, but at least I'm doing something to see that I don't have the strength yes. to uh, change this anger. That's very good. That's a very good basic point. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, if I see that I get angry during the day, what am I seeing really? I'm seeing that I'm on this, this old, lonely, desolate, fault shore and maybe even pretending that I'm not there. But if I, I say today I'm not going to be angry about anything, and then I get angry, I have made progress, because I see that I can't do. Therefore, there's something wrong with my reasoning, and we know what that is, which is simply thinking that thought can do it. But the thought, I won't be angry, is just a thought. And the next five minutes, when you displease me, I get angry. So I've learned that making a resolution will do nothing for me because it's on the plane of thought, and thought cannot rise above itself. So there has to be something about thought. So to see that I can't behave properly is a first step in truly behaving properly. Is that more or less a summary or not? Do you want to add something? That's great. And look at the humi humiliation involved in that. Humiliation, humiliation is therefore valuable to my self-work. If you want, you can talk about disobedience. I mean, uh, excuse me, about obedience to the wrong things. Go ahead. Anyone? Make a, uh, for me to make a right decision and stick to it. Make an everyday right decision and stick to it. Self-obedience. All right, there is such a thing as a right thought. If we can stick to that and make that stronger, is still understanding nature thought, then that's all right. It's simply, if you have the thought, now I'm not going to live in misery anymore, that's a good thought. That's not a bad thought. All thoughts are not bad. They're very good thoughts. Some thoughts are, are very helpful, and we must put more of those into the battle on our own side. A thought, a thought, it's the thought that telling a lie in order to impress people is wrong. That's a good thought. This is the same as not compromising with the truth. Sure. I have to study my nature. All these things have gone over many times. I have to study my feelings. <coughs> I have to study how my imagination works, for example, how my imagination wants to present a beautiful dream picture. Uh, I won that beautiful blonde, I attracted her eye, I, I'm a successful businessman, whatever. I have to understand how my nature works wrongly and takes me away from myself. 
So study of everything about me is quite necessary. Not judging anything, but, but studying it. So that I can learn, for example, to drop imaginative thought, which may be quite pleasurable to my old nature, but which is taking me away from myself. And I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to wander off into imagination. The imagination, for example, that tomorrow will be better than today, that's a false thought. That puts me in time, which puts me in thought. When I drop thought, I drop time. Therefore, I'm free right now, not tomorrow, when I get a promotion or get financially secure or get free of this mess I got into by stupidly associating with a neurotic that I call a beautiful woman or a handsome man. Why don't you see people as sick instead of physically attractive for once? You ever notice if you've ever got involved, why are you smiling? If you've ever got involved with a attractive person of the opposite sex and then got into trouble with him or her, notice that you don't think about their attractiveness anymore? They're not as attractive anymore, are they? If we'd look at the psychology of a person instead of their physical beauty, we wouldn't so stupidly wander into a mess with them and wouldn't repeat it over and over. It's a sick world. That is a right thought because it's seeing a fact as a fact. Okay, how about the, the key word of obedience? Make connections between what we talked about. An example of uh, crossing the bridge, the first few steps is to see, to stop acting, to stop doing as you normally do. For instance, I have an image of being a generous person, and the first time I start I make up my mind that I'm not going to be generous. Okay, this is still thought. This is what Rudy was talking about. However, I carry this out. The next person who asks me for whatever it is, my time, money, and I begin to shake. Well, this is the first step across the bridge. Okay. You're not acting. You're beginning to shatter your illusion. Yes, yeah. I right. am this type right. of person. Right. You have to go against your ideas of being a nice person, a generous person, which means something in you is going to have to die, mm -hmm. and which is good and necessary, but we still value it, don't we? For example, there, there may be quite a few material rewards for you if you keep up the, uh, the impression to other people that you're a nice, wise person. You're nice and wise. Some people may come to you for advice. And that flatters you, and they might even pay you. You have to give that up. You may have to give the money up. You see the things we have to sacrifice? That we have to pay, pay by giving up? And I will tell you, not to discourage you, but to rather so that we don't go into illusion about this, the things we have to give up are far, far more and far greater than we can imagine. The idea, for example, now, now take this one and work with it. The idea that you can control yourself. What an illusion that is, that you have self-control. You, you know, we only have control as long as exterior events are going nicely, going our way. Let's see how much control you have when you get fired. Let's see how much control you have when someone sees through you something you were hiding. Let's see how much control you have when you when the grocery prices go up and you feel you're, you're at the mercy of someone out there, whoever he is, that raises prices. Let's have the, you may have the idea you're a nice person who never gets bitter, and then you get bitter. Do you have any control? Not at all. Do you know what control is? Control means seeing that there is no one there to control anything. And in that state, you are in control. See? Where there is no controller and the thing to be in control, there is control because control is one thing. 
Control is no control. Now figure that out. Think about it a little bit. It's quite complex because there's preliminary lessons you have to get in order to see it. And whether there is the control of no control, there is complete relaxation. You, you no longer really care what other people think about you. Because somewhere, maybe years ago, you made up your mind and said something like this. You said something like this. Now I hope you did. You said, the only thing on this earth that counts is for me to find myself, to be one with myself, to no longer be a neurotic, to no longer be a slave to my own violence and hatreds. The only thing that counts is to be one with myself, to be in oneness with truth. Therefore, anything I have to do, I will do. If I have to lose my friends, if I have to lose some of my money by giving up dishonest, dishonest or thievery or whatever, if I have to give that, I, I, that's not important. All that's important is to stop being a miserable human being. Now, now start paying for what you want to get. Find ways to pay for it. Find ways to pay for it. And just one example would be in this class or in your study class, wherever it might be, and someone tells you that you're a mechanical machine, that you smile mechanically, that you have hidden hatreds that a, another person might see in you that you don't know about. <clears throat> take it. Go ahead and take it so that you can learn to die to it so you can achieve your aim of not being a self-prisoner anymore. This is tremendous. You should be so excited about this and excited about nothing else in life. If you're excited about anything else, I feel very sorry for you because you're going to have to live in misery until you wake up. And if you don't wake up, you'll have to live in mis misery the rest of your life. Make up your mind what you want. If you're listening to this tape, just make up your mind what you want. You can't have both. We're here to help each other make the right choice. And I, I hope indeed that you deeply see how miserable you really are, how afraid you are. That is the first step across the bridge. Now we're helping each other to take the rest of the necessary steps. And no one is condemned for anything. If you're a hypocrite, which you are, by the way, hypocrisy being self-division, there are two people in you or rather 50 people in you instead of one. Self-division and self-hypocrisy uh, being the same thing. If this is the state you're living in and you see it, then I congratulate you for seeing it. Because now we can go on from that. A hypocrite who doesn't know he's a hypocrite will remain a self-punishing hypocrite. And oh, will he be afraid, won't he? Why will he be afraid? Because he's afraid that somebody's going to see through him. Who wants to live like that? I'm not going to. You can if you want. Go ahead. I'm not going to. Nothing counts but to get out. Let's start being obedient to our... You want to use the phrase cosmic nature? Do you, do you want to call it being obedient to God? Okay, that's all right. Call it being obedient to truth? Call it what you want, but let's do it. Instead of being obedient to our old, miserable nature. Okay, comments? Raise your hand when you speak, and one will turn that on, on because I don't want too long a silent time. Raise your hand and he'll turn it on. Right, valuation comes into this. The more we value truth, the more we're <clears throat> going to start crossing the bridge. Get over the right, way. right valuation, <clears throat> which comes by seeing wrong valuation. Right. It happens. Isn't that beautiful that it happens by itself as we do what we have to do? 
you, we're not creating truth or value. We're getting rid of the valueless. And the valuable comes into view of itself. Who will comment for the benefit of those who have never heard it before, perhaps some of you listening to this tape, who will comment on the need to no longer value foolish negative emotions which may be very exciting but still very foolish. Obedience to our own negative emotions is a mistake. It keeps us on the miserable shore. Who will comment on that? Okay. He would see some of my is to see some of my falseness and be faithful to breaking away from it. Faithful to breaking away from it. That's okay. That's fine. That's what it's all about. You know, we get a certain sense of security by being obedient to a rule, whether it's the rule of mom and papa or the church or of a, a moral code, we get a certain sense of security. If I follow these rules and be good, I will be accepted by society, I will be respectable, I will get along with a minimum of trouble in the world. And we get real bitter and confused because it really doesn't make us any more acceptable or respectable than we were before we adopted these rules. And it confuses us. In other words, there's no payoff. We're always looking for the payoff for doing something. If I am good, God will take me to heaven when I die. If I am good, I'll be respected by people or whatever. You know that the payoff never really comes and it can't come. Not a real payoff because you get false payoffs by society. By following the rule of being publicly respectable, you might be elected to public office, you might get more business that way, and you may get outer rewards, but you're now divided from yourself, are you not? And you know, if, if we wanted nothing more than to escape from this inner confusion about it, we say, if I do this, I will get that and therefore be happy or secure. And we're always doing this, but there's no real payoff. Well, maybe we make the commission in selling the product, whatever it might be, or we follow the rules. And underneath we have a great bitterness because nothing really happens the way society said it would, and it never can. Let's live from the rules that we sense are right, instead of those that society, including mom and papa, told us was right. And see what happens. And see what happens is that when you put your first step on the bridge, you'll start to shake and feel insecure. It, it, it's, it's absolutely astonishing. Here's a man on the miserable side of the shore, shaking with fear all the time, pretending, of course, that he's not shaking with fear. And then someone points out to him the bridge there. So this shaking man who's afraid of life and death and his wife and everybody else, he shakingly walks toward the bridge and shakingly puts his first foot out and then he says an incredible thing. He says, I'm not going to do this. It's too scary to do this. So he goes right back and shakes again. He doesn't see that he always, always was in fear. He says, this is scary. You are scary. Why don't you stay with it by keeping that foot out? So that something different can happen to you. You don't want anything different at all, do you? You want the same old way. Your same old pseudo-security. 
let's help each other get that first foot out there and then help each other to stay there. I will tell you, and I tell you this to this tape, unless you do these things we're talking about, including the illustration of the bridge, unless you do these things, what, are you going to, what else are you going to do with your life? I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, what are you going to do with it? You, you have nothing to do with it except to live with its misery. Now, let me ask you another question. What's it like living with you? What's it like? You know what it's like. It's awful, isn't it? You know it and I know it. And if you don't know it, I know it. We have no place to go except toward the bridge. Let's get, get on with it. And let's stick with it. And, and look, let's not mind a bit that we're right out there in that middle of that shaky, trembling bridge and we're terrified and don't know what to do. Don't mind being there. Don't mind it at all. Just stay there. That's, that's, you have no choice anyway. Because if you're in the middle of the bridge trembling and you go back to the what you call solid ground, you're still as trembling there, but now you're lying about it. The object in going out in the middle of the bridge and trembling is to start being honest about it, to stop lying about the state you're in. That is what changes you. When you're trembling on the solid, so-called solid ground, you're living in a state of illusion, of lying, of hypocrisy. The value of the bridge is to see that we are in that state and no longer lie about it, and the end of the lie will be the end of the shaking. Everyone who is unhappy is lying, deceiving himself. That's clear, isn't it? Isn't that clear? Right. So the two are the same thing. Well, you know, wouldn't it, isn't it strange that we don't say, well, self-honesty will begin to free me from myself. But if you say, I already am honest, then no hope, no hope at all. Because now you're lying about your honesty. Comments? Also, we can lie about being obedient. Yeah. You know, I'm also obedient, which uh, when some challenge comes up, you find out that you are not obedient, which is right. See, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, see, when we... When we're not obedient to the truth itself, to God, if you like, prefer that, that lie, uh, disobedience, represents running back to the old shore, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Trying to play it safe by staying within familiar thoughts. They're miserable, but they're familiar. And we don't want to drop the familiar. It's so frightening, but do it and be scared. Be frightened. You have never ever been told here to not be scared. At a certain level, that is perfectly proper because it's a generalization. If I say to you, don't be scared of what you run into in this class, that is perfectly proper. But in another way, another sense, we tell you, I want you to go ahead and be ten times as scared as you are. Which simply means, I want you to be out in the middle of that bridge conscious of how scared you really are. See, when I see what a liar I've been, what a hypocrite, how much violence I have in me, and it shakes me, that shaking is enabling me to not, not compromise, not go back, and in that staying with it, something real magical will happen to you and, and you'll experience this have any of you experienced it even in a small way what we're talking about huh all right if you've experienced it in a small way why don't you take another step out so that you get even more shaken so that you even more don't know what to do with your life you're not nearly desperate enough see you still think you know what to do with your life which is a monstrous lie. It's a horrible lie. You never have known. So get, 
get even more desperate. I'll put it this way. I give you all permission, including those of you listening to the tape, I give you full and a complete permission to be far more scared than you pretend you are, that, that the pretense is there. I give you far more, I give you permission to be completely scared, to be completely miserable. Without hiding anything. You're hiding so much. Or at least you think you are. Most husbands don't hide the kind of a person they really are from their wives, do they? Most wives don't hide from their husbands the kind of a person she really is. When you live with someone, you get to know them. There's not much, much hiding there. The husband and wife goes out in public and they both behave like saints. They both know that they're really devils because they know how they behave at home. Do you, do you want to live this way? It's up to you. Try to get yourself into more conflict than you are, not with the exterior world, but with yourself, which is simply another way of saying become more conscious of the conflict you have in yourself. Uh, see, I try to impress people, and I see this, and I begin not to try and impress people. And each time I step on the bridge, each time I refuse to impress, then I'm gaining on the other side because other people will be less impressive to me. The one goes with the other. Right. Right. So each time you dare to step, you gain on the other side. It's automatic. Another way to put that. Excuse me, go ahead. Finish. No, I was just going to say, we don't need to look for results. If we want, the results come. Automatic. Uh-huh. Are you sort of saying there's an automatic attraction to the unknown? Uh, no, I'm saying that if we work on ourselves, which is taking the step on the bridge, mm. and the more we cross the bridge, the more we are going to, if I want to be impressive, and I see that, and I work on this, then the result is that other people are going to stop uh, being impressive to me. I mean, you gain on the other side without trying. Uh -huh. The only thing we need to do is work on ourselves and the results come. That's my, really what I'm my saying. My feeling, uh, in line with what you said, but the way I, the way I feel it, mm -hmm. instead of me going to that heaven or to that reward, there is an attraction that I that I don't know yet, that is drawing, that is drawing me to it. I'm not going to heaven. I'm not going out and get the million dollar reward. The gold will glitter and it will automatically attract me to the truth. The, the other side That's is That's all right. Mm -hmm. It's a figure of speech, which is what mm -hmm. we're using, figures of speech. Another thing to add to what Sally said, what she is saying in a way is that we cease to build gods and heroes. You say you said that we are no longer impressed by people, and that is good, isn't it? Because now you're no longer putting an authority outside of yourself. You're not necessarily a religious teacher or teacher of these truths, but a successful person. You no longer admire. Follow this. Follow this. Mm -hmm. Say you see someone who has achieved great wealth or great fame, and and you haven't, and you look at this person. And when we were young and foolish, we used to admire these people. Because one of, our, one of our hundred delusions toward this person is that he himself did something to achieve this great fame and fortune. Which simply means we're still under the illusion that we can do something of ourselves to achieve fame and fortune. See how the, we project things? So when I begin to end my admiration of the rich man and the famous man, that means that I'm also destroying a certain self-admiration, the admiration that I am an independent ego who can do something. But it doesn't really exist. Are you following? See? As I destroy a false god, I destroy the false god in myself because the inner God projects itself out there. 
And so I no longer have self-admiration, which is simply vanity, right? So see how vanity goes away too? So the ending of, of admiration and hero worship of other people must be done and goes automatically with the destruction of the belief in a separate ego who can achieve things. We no longer credit ourselves for anything, therefore never condemn ourselves for anything because they're both on the same level of opposite thought. See how self-condemnation not only does disappear but must disappear just as much as self-praise does? I like the last illustration you gave on uh, being scared of the bridge to walk, to take a step, go in. I say to myself, I scare if I walk on it, or if I try to walk across it. So I turn around and say, I'll go sightseeing or do something else to cure it. See, I do not see my contradictions that I am scared, not that bridge there. I am scared myself and that I can do something about it. The bridge ain't got nothing to do. I'm just plain scared. See? But I delude myself saying that the bridge has something to do with it. Mm -hmm. So You are the bridge. Right. Right. That's I'm playing scared. I mean, it's so simple, yet uh, mm. people don't see it. Mm. You're just, just scared. I mean, uh, the bridge ain't gonna have to do with it. it, it that's, that fear will remain in you, regardless of what you go and do. You think you can still dissolve that fear. Okay? And then you go sightseeing, or you go for emotional trails, and you say, see, I'm, I can do something about it. Yeah. But you haven't done anything. You said... <clears throat> One, the greatest fear is that we don't exist. Yes. That would be the basis That's of That's the fundamental fear. That we, we don't... We think we've got a thousand fears, but the, the one that we can't see, and that, but that operates in us all the time, is that we don't exist. All right, but now explain that a little bit. What do you mean you don't exist? We're sitting here, we all exist. What? See, explain that to people who may not understand that. What, one? All right, we exist physically because we, we are a physical being. We don't exist as we've been told we do. We don't exist as we think we do. We don't exist as, even my name is, is laden with associations. It's laden with emotions. If it's said in one way, I might tremble. If it's said in another way, I might purr. Right. The, uh, I don't exist the way my family and society told me I do. I don't exist the way I have since told myself I do. The only thing is, it has to, for me, go beyond intellectual knowledge. And I have to see it emotionally, deeply, really understand it. Yes. And this is the, the shakiness, apparently, of Ooh, yes. all of the things that I always thought that I was, whether I called them good or bad, or whether other people called them good. Right, or bad. right, right. And I don't, I, I see that I can't just drop it because it's a part of me. It's a vital, living... It's the only person you've real. ever known. Right. You've never known anyone that, but that. And so if I ask you to give that up, look how you're going to shake getting out on that bridge. But we, through understanding it, are giving ourselves courage, if you want to use that term, to get out on that bridge and endure Go ahead, if you had more. No, I think that's fine. Anyone want to talk about the bridge? Do you all understand? It's a, obviously an illustration. Go ahead. Perhaps the reason within myself that psychological bridge shakes is because I carry so many phony burdens, so many false personalities, yeah. and the load is so heavy that the structure has to quiver because of the garbage or phoniness that I carry. Yeah, that's uh, adding to the illustration, yes. The extra weight makes the bridge shake. If we could leave them on the other side, we would go over a little more lightly, wouldn't, mm. wouldn't it? To carry the illustration a little further. 
Illustrations are good, by the way, but let's not uh, carry them so far that we begin to think that the illustration is the, the truth itself. You'll be standing at the end of that bridge with all your family and friends who are trying to hold you back and in the indecision to make that first step and then to make that first step to go off alone. And of course, and they're going to they're going to do all kind of things to keep you from taking that first step because now they feel threatened. They do. You understand this, don't you? Mm -hmm. You understand that? You understand it? No? Their Who will explain security, that? Their false security is gone. Uh, hypothetically, take a person. Gee, he is not going to support me anymore. Who can I go cry to? Who will beat the children? Who will correct, excuse me. Who will correct the children? Oh my, in their words, Oh my God, what will I do now? He's gone. Yeah. You see why all real books say you have to stand all alone in this? Don't lean on your wife, your husband, the church, or anyone else. You're all alone in this. You have to find the truth all by yourself. And one of the first shakings is when you've got that foot out, you've got that foot out, and all your friends and relatives start telling you, all kind of lies. Lie one. You are perfectly safe here. Why are you venturing out on that shaky bridge? Here they are, violent, fearful people telling you that it's fearful out there. See how, again, how ridiculous it is? Lie two, three, four. Just listen to them. Go ahead. It's almost like a tremendous fear of death. Uh, like it's associated with death. It is indeed. Like, we shall never see each other again. Like uh, we're going to be totally different, and there's not going to be no more ties. You know? Ties, yes. No Comfort, more. security, yeah. familiar faces. Mm -hmm. You know, I will change the track abruptly by asking you a question. Maybe some night, Monday, Tuesday, Sunday, Saturday, you have your favorite television program. And for some reason or other, you can't watch it. Uh, it comes on at 8, say, and, and at 5 minutes to 8, uh, the phone rings and it's an important call, or you suddenly realize you have to go down the, the street on some business or something. and. This is your favorite program. You got to see it every week, and you and you're disappointed over it, and maybe even resentful over this unexpected last-minute interruption to you seeing your program. Let's see now. You do a little work here. I want you to explain to me why you feel resentful over not being able to see your favorite television program. Why? From all we've studied, why do you permit yourself to be negative? That's what it is. You're negative. You're in a wrong state. Why? Over missing that favorite program. You understand why? This is part of the bridge. Because this program is giving me a sense of security. This happens every week, say, or every month. I watch a particular program. And this is familiar to me. And it's keeping me safe. Right. And Very I good. want to remain safe if I'm not working. Yeah. Whether it's so, the baseball game or... Uh -huh. or so the, it's telling me you're stable. This happens all the time. It'll happen next week and so forth. But uh -huh. when it's interrupted like anything else, then we do... Yeah. Yeah. The oddity of watching just that. Periodically I go visit my mother. Her television is one of her companions. And there's a couple of doctor things or life begins and something on it. And uh, she will beg me to come visit. I come, I drop in to visit, and I'll be darned if she doesn't have to see her boob tube. And I'll sit there and stare at the ceiling or something. She wants me there, yet she feels such a compulsion she can't miss one of those series of uh, life could be beautiful or whatever. It's strange, strange. <coughs> I look. Here's the person. Five minutes, the program comes on. He's got all these, as Sally pointed out, he's, it's a sense of familiarity. It gives him something to do, or her something to do. And you've got this expectation. In five minutes, 
In five minutes from now, I'll have a familiar excitement. The baseball game, football game, the drama show, whatever it might be. All of a sudden, the phone rings and you have to leave and you, you know you won't be back till the show is half over. All of a sudden, you feel robbed. You feel empty. But here's what, now listen, here's what it really is. You don't know what to do with yourself. For, for a second, you're out in the middle of that bridge, frightened, because you don't know what to do with yourself. That program was going to give you, your mind, something to occupy itself with for the next hour. Therefore, you would not be able to, you would be able to hide from yourself all these fears that you have. Your distraction is gone. And because it was a lot of emotion watching that baseball game. Because your favorite team is up for the World Series. A, a lot of power in there. Your distraction is gone, and for a split second, you are terrified because you're without a familiar thought. So what do you do? I'll tell you what you do. You immediately shove another one in. Why did they phone then? Why couldn't they have waited an hour? Anything. Anything to fill up the void. See what we're trying to do? Leave the void there. Leave the vacant space there so that we're trembling not knowing what to do. That is what wakes us up. And that's what destroys the need to have a distraction. Boy, what a... Uh, do you see the hundreds of opportunities we have every day? Boy, we're in school from the minute we get up. In fact, 24 hours of the day we're in school. Don't, don't miss the lessons. The familiar is an illusion of stability. Boy, that's a good sentence. The familiar is an illusion of stability. That was a very good, concise <laughs> sentence. Okay. Well, yes. On Monday, I become my normal self. <laughs> Starting Monday till Friday. All right. Is that on one? Yeah, it's on. <laughs> <laughs> it's only for Connie anyway. That's <laughs> Connie probably doesn't know. All right, now, Rudy, I want you to explain to all of this what you mean by that. In other words, I think what you're implying is that on Saturday and Sunday, you're a different kind of a person than the other days of the week. Well, Why are you divided like that? Well, only for about, <laughs> let's see, uh, from 9 until 11. <laughs> Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, I live from week to week, seeing, see if I can change, you know, something during the week. All right. And during the meeting, I can check myself, see how much I have done by my feelings that I have during the meeting. And? Which are much. <laughs> <laughs> see, back to this program a minute. I can't watch the program. And my expectations are built up to five minutes before it goes on. My false nature feels robbed of something, doesn't it? Feels robbed. But it was a false feeling to begin with. Therefore, if I didn't have this feeling, I would not feel robbed and wouldn't go into all these other unnecessary and destructive emotions about it. This may be a small example, but get your own, where you may feel robbed by an event. You will we'll see that the robbing is all in ourselves and nowhere else. We get very nasty about it. Yeah? yeah? Yeah. Most of which we hide yeah. from others. Oh, and we think we do. Yes. Let me add another point we haven't discussed for some time, but let me bring it in in case those of you listening to this tape haven't heard about it. What's let me ask anyone listening to this now whether in the last all right, let's say the last month, any of you have even thought a thought of revenge toward another human being? Let me see your hand. You have thought a thought of revenge. Why did you destroy yourself? You know what? Good. I didn't destroy myself. Pardon? I didn't destroy myself. I felt wonderful. Sure you did. Wonderful destruction. See, you know what revenge is? To connect it with what we're talking about. 
Revenge? Look, you hurt my feelings. You call me a name. You insult me. When you do that, that has injured my images of being a nice person, a worthy person, a person that you should be nice to. I feel a sense of loss, don't I? You have robbed me of my beautiful dream of being a nice person by insulting me. Maybe I thought I was intelligent and you say I'm stupid. I feel insulted. And I feel a loss of me, which is false to begin with. That's just an idea I have that I'm intelligent. Immediately, what am I going to do to fill up this loss so that I don't feel empty? Ah, revenge. I can't take revenge on you physically or I'll get arrested. Or you may be bigger than me and you'll hit me back, something like that. But boy, can I take revenge in here on you. I can mentally insult you or strike you physically, mentally, whatever I do. What does it do? You see, that fills the void with agitation, with a false feeling of life. Now I feel like somebody again, therefore I don't feel quite so scared. And I've destroyed myself. What if the next time you, I think I'm intelligent and you call me stupid and I feel a sense of loss of self, I just stick with that? Huh? What if I stay out in the middle of the shaky bridge and try, don't try to do anything about it? Do you know what I do? I end the running of mechanical thought and end the tyranny of mechanical, emotionalized thought over me. In other words, instead of thinking at that time, I become conscious. And by being conscious, I become free of the tyranny of thought. But if I rush in with thought of revenge, I'm going to get back, I'm going to get even. I filled it up with another thought, the second thought, and have stayed right where I am. No, worse than I am. So I have to stay out in the middle of the bridge without filling the vacancy with anything at all. Do you understand this? Yeah. I end mechanical thought and mechanical emotion. Therefore, I've gained something, haven't I? I gained a little better understanding of how my mind and feelings work. And that's all in the world we're after in this group. Nothing else on earth but understanding. And that contributes to it. I falsely tell myself I am in charge of my, in charge or in control of my emotions. Yet I'll stand on this imaginary bridge and my own emotions are shaking me. I am not in control of my emotions. They are in control of me is why I shake. If I'll step back and look at it. Right. Or stand right in it and see it. Uh-huh. Look at it. Revenge is sweet. Work against ourselves is not. Say that again, Revenge Mark. is sweet. Work against ourselves is not. That's good. Right. That's just about what you said. Revenge is the familiar, work against ourselves is the unfamiliar, and it's easier to go along, easier, and I think I'd have to put that in quotes, to go along with the familiar. Okay, uh, to say it again differently, we have to die to the wonderful thrill of thinking revenge against anyone. And of course, the thought on proper occasions could breed the act, and the act will be one of violence in one way or another. One way or another. Go ahead. I say that uh, vindication is violence. Yes. When, when I got fired, I wanted to vindicate myself verbally against the people I worked with, against yeah. my boss. I wanted to show his immoral nature yeah. and my in, my nature of innocence. And yeah. I got in, introspecting this, and I could come down. I can't figure out why I constantly did that. I constantly I was doing this, trying to show his, his immoral act and my innocence, and it must be some form of violence. I can come out, I'd do the same thing to him if I had a chance. Yes, and destroying the world. All right, now let me ask you. This idea of a sense of loss of self is a fundamental thing too. The sense of loss of self. When you were fired, you felt a sense of loss of self, correct? Whether yes. you know it or not. Yes. Do you understand that? So the thoughts of revenge were trying to fill the vacuum. Because you didn't know who you were anymore. You were a good employee or a good worker or whatever. And he fired you. That's pretty shocking, isn't it? The, the image was, sh was shattered, wasn't it? What image am I going to put it in this place? I started arguing with the boss who fired me and said, you, you yourself are a hypocrite. I know all about you. I'm already 
rebuilding that image, which means I'm, I'm more solidly stuck to myself than ever before. If I stuck with it and didn't fill it, that would destroy it. Who, do you, really, do you know what we've discovered here? How on earth did we ever get to the point where we see this, the very fundamentals by which we can set ourselves free? How did we ever get to this tremendous point? Repeat that once more, if you will, about, about um, being filled and empty. Okay, start from the start from the very beginning. I am fired by the boss. While I'm work before I was fired, I had images of being a good worker or something like that, and a uh, good bookkeeper, whatever it was. All of a sudden, to my great shock, I get fired. The big shock, there's a secondary shock of wondering, well, how am I going to earn money? But that's a secondary one, believe me. That comes later. The great big shock is, why is this I at the mercy of that I? What right does another so-called ego have the right to do this to my ego? You've created opposites already. And your illusion of having a separate self with all its labels of being a good worker, of being intelligent, of being worthy, of being liked and all that, has suddenly become shattered. The minute the image becomes shattered, you get scared. Because this image, which was just an illusion, was falsely telling you who you were. A good worker, a nice guy, liked by everybody, and the girl down the, down the hall winks at you, so therefore you're not bad looking either, and you're hoping a romance would develop. Now you're fired, and that's the end of her and everything. A, a hundred unconscious thoughts goes through your mind. All right. For a split second, you are nobody. See? You're nobody, which we really are. We really are nobody. Okay, so far? This is so unendurable, so unacceptable, so terrifying that mechanical thought and mechanical emotion immediately rush in and say, how can I get over being scared? See? So it does come in. And in your case, it, it happens to choose revenge. It could choose a thousand things. In this case, revenge. That guy isn't going to fire me like that. I'm going to tell him off. I caught him fooling around too. I know a few things about him. You've restored the eye. You think it's just another illusion, isn't it? Now that you're a guy who has something on somebody else, now, and, and maybe even you have a sense of power now, huh? You know something he, about him he doesn't know you know, for example. And now you've got something on him. So revenge is a, another uh, another attempt to fill the the vacancy, the fear of not existing. So we let mechanical emotion, mechanical thought, come in and make a wrong move to reestablish the me. Now, and we've learned nothing now, have we? We're right back where we... The opportunity we could have used to be nothing, to watch mechanical thought and new labels, trying to replace the old destroyed labels. I'm powerful. I, I may be stupid, okay, but now I'm powerful because I got something on him and I'm going to threaten him and get revenge and go down to a lawyer or whatever. See? You've kept I in place and now you're still sick. If I had been alert and awake and he fired me and I looked at the fact that he fired me without adding anything, without a second thought, the second thought of revenge, I would have been free of it. Then the only thing left would be my instinctive center, which is free. I'm free of neurotic reaction. The only thing left would be my instinctive center that says, all right, here's the fact. I get fired. Therefore, I won't get a paycheck from him anymore. Therefore, tomorrow morning, I'm going to go out and go to the employment agency. I'm going to go to the state board of employment, whatever it is, and I'm going to try to get other work. The end of it! And that's the end of the tape.